They're coming to get you, Barbara. In Springfield, Oregon, dead Mopar muscle cars are coming back to life. Restored by Mopar master Mark Warman. Joined by his out of this world cousin Dougie. Oh, hi, Mark. His apprentice and daughter, Alyssa. Whoa, whoa, stop. And his childhood best friend, Royal. Mark hates everybody. His protege painter, Will Scott. You got one job. This is Graveyard Car. So we are installing the numbers matching drivetrain in our 1968 Plymouth Roadrunner 383 four-speed. Now, this is the Curtis's vehicle that we introduced earlier in the season. It is almost finished. Once we get the drivetrain in it, we can put the headliner in it, the rest of the interior, put the trim and ornamentation, and that car waves bye-bye. All right. How's the, how'd the wedding go? Good. Are wedding went well. Honeymoon went better. So little Royal got married, my little buddy, finally hitched. That's right, ladies, unfortunately, Chrome Dome is off the market. The wedding was great. Only being able to have, you know, 25 people at the wedding. We didn't want a big wedding anyway, so the pandemic kind of made that possible. I'm glad for you, Royal. I see that hey. uh, she's cooking for you a lot. Yeah. Well, I don't know how long he's been engaged, because he didn't share that with me, just he's engaged now, all of a sudden he's getting married. But based on like a weight scale, I'd say he's been with that gal six to eight months, because he's packed on about 25, 30 pounds, and that's okay. Royal did all the lean years. He was a bachelor, it's okay. All right, gentlemen, are you ready? A lot of the parts on the cars that we're doing, they are replicas of the original. In this particular case, we found a source for the factory appearing classic black shocks. These are actual oil-filled shocks, and they are exactly the way they would have been on the assembly line back in the day the car was built. I'm gonna lower it down till you say... Go? Uh, Grimms. Grimms? Grimms, okay. What if I say flicks? I don't care what you say. I just gotta let it down no. low enough so that they can put the uh, leaf spring purchase into the torque box area, the shackle mounting area. Oh, flicks. Flicks? Yeah. That's it? Okay. All right, let's go do this thing. Not that they need my help, but I'm here more as a motivational speaker. I haven't yet. Let me, there we go. It's a real blessing to be able to work with your best friend, your cousin who's also your best friend, and work on the cars that we used to work on when we were kids. You got a pair of side cutters, Dougie? Yes, sir. You hand me a yes, pair Yes, sir. There? I made it to the wedding. It was a cute little ceremony. That was great. It was great to see Mark there. Did Mark? Ruin the wedding in any way? Did he stand up or object? No, Mark was Mark was very well behaved at the wedding. Wonderful. Well, there it was are. a beautiful wedding. Thanks. It was the only time I've ever seen you in Dockers, and I never want to see you again in Dockers. Hey, I rocked them. It's been maybe since the early 80s that I saw Royal in a pair of Dockers. They were cool then, too. Some things just never go out of style. But he was sporting some Dockers and a nice shirt. He looked good. And my wife liked them. Like them coming off. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> One thing is true that I notice the older that I get, there's not a lot of new material. <laughs> you know, a kid punched me in the face once because of my mouth? No. <laughs> I know you find that hard to believe. I really haven't changed much. Even though I should have learned lessons, and I have learned some, I haven't learned the important ones that keep you from getting your face kicked in. So when I was in sixth grade, I was in Mr. Lamb's class, and I'm looking around, and I catch Doug Y back here over my left shoulder, and, and he's doing this. He's doing this around. <laughs> what are you doing, man? Shut up, Warman, he says to me. Well, no, I'm just saying, it's, it's not bright out. Why are you squinting? Shut up, Warman. I'm warning you. But I can't resist. Something inside of me couldn't resist. It was a few minutes later. I did a pass around the room. Old Squintin Tarantino's back there doing his thing. I said, dude, man, dude, what's with it? And I didn't even get to finish it. Your ass is grass at 3 o'clock. I leave class early. I go out. I walk out the back steps down where the bike rack was. Both tires are flat. He got me. 
So I take off booking for home, right? And I'm cruising along, I got it, I got it. I round the corner and Doug comes out of the alley, blindsides me, takes me to the ground. I'm laying on the ground with my hands to my side <clears throat> and he just sized it up and kabowie, he just not, that's why my honker's over to one side. Valuable lesson, valuable lesson that I did not heed. Okay, are you guys lined up? Beautiful. Well, how you doing, my friend? My Good. follically challenged buddy. Good. Where you standing? Hang on, right there. there. I got it. Yeah. No, 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 I'm good. I'm using it like a mirror. Oh, I got you. You know, in the spirit of me and my mouth, I do like to tease people. It's kind of my milieu, if you will. Yeah, look that up later. I think it's like French or something, Italian, Latin. It's torturing people. Now with Royal, he's always had a lot of material for me. Okay, because he's always been bald. Here, push in on that, will you? How is there no stubble? Which way? Back in the pool shooting days, we used to go down to a little place called Tom's Pool Hall. And back then I called him Cue Ball, Cue Ball Morton, right? Yeah, he had a few few odd nicknames. It's a scary place Mark goes in his brain. <laughs> in the 80s, um, Pac-Man, perfectly round head and his lower jaw would move, but nothing else moved on him. So I've always had fun teasing him. It's what I do. I think he likes it. I have no nicknames for Mark that I can use on television. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Oh yeah, the undercoat's wet. Uh, I see that. Got it all over my wedding ring. What's that, one of those diabetic watches? Tells you when you ate too much? No, it's like uh, 10,961 steps I've got today. Where? I'm sorry, I gotta call time out on that. Will's always talking about these steps. Yeah, I did 10,000, I did 20,000, I did 30,000 a day. How? How could you possibly do that? You work four hours a day for the school district changing locks. First of all, I don't change locks at the school. Not all the time. What do you go from Vanita to Eugene on foot? How do you get 30,000 steps in four hours? I would love to know the answer to this. Because I'm around here like that Tasmanian devil. Everywhere I go, it's just a great big hurricane of dust. I'm, I'm booking and I'm getting like five, 6,000 steps in. As far as my steps go, I have no trouble getting in 10,000 steps a day plus. Like right now, I'm, you know, it's one o'clock and I'm at, oh, 8,600. I thought I would have more than that. Why are you getting mad? Are you gonna hit a corner of a wall with your knuckle again? Nope, I learned the first time, Mark. Uh, we got a lot of old history. Around 1979, my girlfriend at the time, Tammy C., uh, didn't like my charger, my 70 Charger 3 to 3 two barrels. I drove crazy. It was me or the car, get rid of one of us, so I got rid of my car. Guess what I found the other day? What? Mm. True story, honest story, gospel. You know anybody that starts out like that's a lie, right? Yeah. This is true. Anyway, I traded my car in for a 1968 Volkswagen. It was a street bug back then. It had a California kid on it, but I immediately took it home, took all the California stuff off of it, popped the engine out of it. Me and Tammy C's dad rebuilt the engine. We built it up to a 1650 dual port head, dual carburetor, it's a good running engine. Then we made it into a Baja bug. I found the spot that we almost rolled the Baja bug. Uh, one of the maiden voyage, I went and picked up Royal and we went up to the track. We'd go around the back side of the hill and all of a sudden it lost traction and the car just went down. Very, very dangerous moment right there because I couldn't get any traction to go forward. And if you backed up, you're over the side of a cliff. So I just told Royal to hang on. I got out. I mean, obviously, this is no reason for two people to die. And a twist of irony, when I got out, it actually balanced it better. So in a way, I saved his life. Oh, did you? I walked all the way over the top of the hill and down the side, and I could see the two, the was old trails. Was that trail. yours or mine? It was my Baja bug. I just okay. happened to bail out of it when it got ready to roll with you still in the passenger seat. So he abandoned you in a car? Yes, he did. Mark abandoned me in the car. You know, later I went to town and I got a truck and went back up there and, and towed him out. I remember being in the car, it's starting to slide, and he got out and uh, Doug came up and pulled us out. He was pale when I got back. He was real scared, real scared. I came back. So on a 1970 Roadrunner, it's ready for its first primer. Now this is a rare little car. So it's a 70 Roadrunner V-Code 446 barrel. It's a four-speed car. It's FC7 in violet for the Plymouth lineup with a black top and a white reverse stripe on the back end of it. Very attractive car. When it came to us, it was in dire straits. We literally had to replace almost every piece of metal on that car. 
We did the floors, wheelhouses, inner and outer, trunk floor, trunk floor extensions, rear body panel, trunk gutters, Dutchman panel. Both fenders had to be repaired. They were damaged, but they were originals. They don't, they don't make new ones of those, so we repaired those and got those into the paint shop. Both doors were replaced with good donor doors because those original ones were rotten. It was a real rusty car. So once all the metal work is done, completed, looks good, Mark is signed off on it, then it goes right out to the mudroom. We spend more time in the metal shop and less time in the Bondo department. With that being said, nobody metal finishes cars. So using Bondo, everybody does. The amount that you use is the problem. So if the metal work is right, which it always is, goes to the body shop, they'll spend the time doing all their body work, making sure everything's been sanded down, everything's straight, style lines are good. With a good body man, the, the car doesn't need much. That first coat of primer is like a skim coat of glaze. Any wobbles, any waves, any imperfections, pinholes, because when you body work a whole car, it does get kind of blinding. So it's real important that first coat of primer, you're able to get your first one or two coats on, take a step back and look for any issues. That way you can put an extra coat of primer if needed. So that way when they go to block it out, those little imperfections, there's enough material on that car to fix it by blocking it out. So after the first primer is done, completed, everything looks great, we like to let the car sit for a week or two, really dry, make sure if there's no swelling, no issues, just let that thing dry, so critical. It goes back into the mudroom, and then they can address any issues that maybe we all missed uh, by blocking the whole car down with like 120 grit, get a great block on it, address any little fine details, then at that point, it comes back to me then Noah and I will go over the car, see if it's truly ready, and then we can primer it for the second time. So today I'm gonna to put the decals on our 1969 and a half Super B. It's one of the last steps that I gotta do before we can put the hood on the car. We already got the hood pins mounted on the car and the plates on the hood, and we're ready to go. With uh, Justin doing the decals on the hood, there isn't a whole lot left on it. One of the things is gonna be the bumblebee stripe still has to go on it. But so far, we've managed just in the last couple of months to get the drivetrain put in, the wheels, the tires, get the exhaust system put in it. The majority of the plumbing, the interior, we've gotten almost everything done on that car. So remember, this is the car that came out of New York, whose his dad had the car and his dad passed away, and so as a tribute to his father, he's having us restore it, it's that car. It's the one from all the way back in season three. Embarrassingly, I have to admit that it's been here that long. But where we are right now is with just another day or two of work on it, we're gonna be able to call the owner, have him come out, and just blow his socks off with this completed 69 and a half, all numbers matching A12 car in F6 Spring Green. I love the graphics on the A12 cars. In this case, got our Super B, so it gets the huge block lettering that calls out six pack. So, try to run a tape line. I'm using original pictures to know exactly where this decal goes in space. And it isn't always where you think that they should go. Common sense would say they would be down a little bit, but they were actually quite a ways up on that side profile. So if that's the way they were when they left the factory, that's the way we have to put them now. Applying the decals on this hood is a lot more tricky because you're applying it to a matte black finish instead of a glossy hood. What that means is when you take your squeegee and you go across the numbers or the letters to get the water out from underneath them, you have to stop pretty close right there. If you go over into the black, you're gonna scuff it. Well, it's a matte finish. So that means you can't go in and buff it. You're done. You have to do it again. So taking your time, using the correct application gel, being patient. Let it dry before you remove the backing off of it. Those are all the keys to a successful decal installation. All right, we can probably start peeling the backing paper off. So I'll do the other side first, and then I'll come back and do this side. Since this is a decal that I've never done on a matte black finish before, so I don't know how pulling the backing paper off is going to work. So I gotta pull it really slow and make sure that thing's really sticking. If not, I gotta start all over. So the six pack decal went on great. You're always gonna be nervous trying to put something on a car like this, especially when you only have one set. But it went on great. The hood's ready to be put on the car, glasses ready to be put in, and get this thing on the road. 
installing the hood back on one of these cars, remember there's no hinges, it's just a set on process. Setting that hood down on there, that's that moment when all of a sudden the rest of the car almost invisibly takes the rest of its shape. It's almost like putting a windshield in. The rest of the lines on the car that you've been looking at forever are completed now. So setting that hood on there, it now becomes that car, that iconic 69 and a half Super B. Back in season four of Graveyard Cars, we restored and brought back to life this 1970 Plymouth Superbird. What engine was in that Superbird? Was it a 440 Super Commando, 446 Barrel, or legendary 426 Hemi? If you think you remember correctly, say it out loud. Stay tuned after the break. I'll let you know how you did. Welcome back, ghouls. How did we do on that one? How's your Graveyard Cars trivia? Our 70 Plymouth Superbird back in season four, what engine did it have? If you said 446 barrel, you are wrong. <laughs> Absolutely wrong. This was a 440 Super Commando. It had the original engine in it. The optional 446 barrel was not in it, nor was the legendary 426 Hemi. But in addition to that, it was an automatic on the column shift, black interior, silver highlights. This car featured all of the typical NASCAR goodies like the decal on the quarter panels, the rear spoiler with the standing bird, and the awesome front end graphics. This car went home to an owner that will never sell it. Raise her up, Dougie. All right, you got shocks on? Yep. All right, looking like we got the rear axle assembly installed in our 1968 Plymouth Roadrunner. 383, four speed, 323 sure grip. We do not have wheels and tires for this car yet. Even if we don't have the wheels and tires, you still gotta put the car together. Royal's got the coolest truck out front. He got a 1978 Macho. Is that Macho it pickup. It's a 1978 Dodge Power Wagon. Macho trim package. Has a roll bar, it's lifted. Has the yellow pinstriping all the way around it. He's got everything. And somebody gave it to him too, because they feel sorry I got for him. I was complaining at a men's group at church that I didn't have a truck. And my now wife, her dad said, well, I got an old Dodge truck. Why don't you come over and look at it? I'll just give it to you. And I said, well, you can't be giving your stuff away, but it turned out that his best friend had given it to him. He had a revolver in the pawn shop and it was gonna cost 400 bucks to get it out. So I went in and gave him the 400 bucks. When I got it, I had to replace two of the freeze plugs to drive it home. I ended up pulling the engine and going through it and replacing the timing chain, all the gaskets. It runs great now. Okay, so we got the rear end assembly in place. Uh, we're getting ready to put the drivetrain for the front end. And uh, we've done so many, it's, it's just great to be able to have nice equipment like this. So I gotta tell you, everything's where it's supposed to be. Everything's fresh and new and ready to go together. It's just my favorite part. So right now is a really wonderful time for me to be able to appreciate the fruits of my hard labor, to be able to set up a shop and even, you know, this little show, silly little show, graveyard cars, that a lot of people said would never make it. We happen to be in our 14th season, so I know who you are, I know. This really is fun for all of us to be back together again, working like we were kids in the best environment and the best tools. We really are having a good time working together again. Who's watching? Now, let me get my eyeball on this thing. Let me get my micro eye on it. Uh, it needs to come over maybe 3 sixteenths of an inch this way. This is a 383, so it's not as wide as the 440s. The K members are all the same width. They're gonna be the same width for a Super B as they are gonna be for a Cuda. But it's the engine itself that makes the clearance issues. Take out the dipstick. If you don't take this out, it gets destroyed. Dougie likes destroying these. It's one of his favorite things. Mark's always accusing me of being the great dipstick destroyer. You know, I think he really sets me up. You know, I'm trying to focus on something and he comes in and just plows right over the top of me, you know. It's nobody's fault that the, you know, dipstick doesn't get pulled. It's not like leaving the fuel lines unhooked all the time. Like he says I do. But what he doesn't tell you is before I can get it hooked up, he'll pull me off onto something else, which turns into something else, which turns into something else. And I forgot. Head on down, Rolo. If you look at the exhaust manifold to exhaust manifold all dressed out, a 383 is about an inch and a quarter narrower at that point of the exhaust manifolds, and those are what's gonna hit those aprons, than a 440 is. Looking good, looking good. 
That's the difference between the B engine, which is what the 383 is, and the RB engine, which is what the 440, 413, 426 wedge are. RB stands for raised block. They get that because they raise the height of the deck. It's a wider block. Come on down some more roll. I call them roll. You just call them Rolo, like the candy? Yeah. I don't know where he came up with the name Rolo, other than the candies, little chocolate-covered caramels. They're delicious. OK, straight down is looking really good here. Good. It was before Congo started shaking everything. OK, oh, come I'm on sorry. down some more. I'm sorry. That's OK. OK, I've got my back bolt started. Go ahead and pull down on the front up here of the body row. It's almost like it was choreographed when you work with these guys. So on top of being a lot of fun, it's also very rewarding to be able to knock out putting a drivetrain together in just, you know, an hour. So we have the K-member bolts in place. They're gonna put the transmission cross member in place. Then we'll put the then we'll put the upper control arms on. Then we will be finitoed for now until we get our wheels and tires. Yeah, it's a real great time for me right now to be able to work with these guys. Love it. And now it's a car again. Having this Roadrunner done is something I've been looking forward to for a long time because the gentleman who owns it and bought it brand new, he's a cancer survivor, he's a fighter. I love fighters. So all that's left is to put the torsion bars in, upper control arms in, front shocks, marry those to the aprons, and then all of the drivetrain is basically in. We still have the propeller shaft, drive shaft, but we can do that tomorrow. I want to go for a ride in the passenger seat. I want to be in the passenger seat and watch Mr. Curtis take that car out and row through the gears like he was 16 years old again. That, to me, would be the ultimate payoff for all the work that we've done on that car. So it's all in place now. They'll do the final Titan torquing. They'll put the assembly line markings on it, and then our drivetrain is completely finished. Good job, guys. Lunch time? I don't know. Should be. Dinner time? Dinner um, time? You, you know why he said dinner time? Not because yeah. it's anywhere near yeah, dinner. It's 10 in the morning. Because Royal held a bolt up, and he no. chimed it like that, mm. like you might a dinner bell, if it was 1880. <laughs> don't, don't make me <laughs> do it. you do it. It's exhausting. What's wrong, Mark? Nothing. Our Daytona Charger is getting really close to being finished. In fact, in a couple of weeks, we've got the owners coming out to check this car out. So all that's left is installing the dash assembly and a few bolt-on items for the car, getting it aligned, and then that car is finished. The dash assembly, just to remind you, was restored by Instrument Specialties. Everything that you see when you pan across it, the knobs, the buttons, the switches, the levers, the face plates, the trim, the surrounds, those are all original to the car. They've just been restored. That you have to respect. That's a quality, quality job. So Mark is here to help me install the dash on the Daytona so I can make all the connections, also make sure it's in the right place. So I'll just set this. Yeah, he's rested on the top of the console and, or somewhere, yeah, on the ground maybe, and then go around and get the other side. Great. We already have the console installed, so we can't just walk through like we normally would do. Okay. God, that's a beautiful dash. Yeah, it looks really good. Love it. So the way it's designed to work is that you bring the dash in and you set the bottom of it, these two legs that come off the bottom part of the framework, on the existing bolts that go into the cowl side panels, the hinge pillars. Okay, drop it. There we go. Got it. Yep. You can then, at that point, have full access to get between the firewall and the dash and make all the connections. Those difficult connections, once it's in place to make, you can make now. Once you have all those connections made, the easiest part is rolling it basically up into place and aligning the provisions in the front of the dash with the bolt holes that are actually in the cowl itself, that windshield mounting area. Got it. There we go. OK. Good. You lay that in there, you put those bolts across there, and you're completely finished with the installation of that dash. Good job, Jimmy. Good job. With the dashboard installed, I'm able to get the steering column in. So it's a two-guy job in the beginning. He has to guide it through the firewall. 
Once it's through the firewall, the steering coupler on the shaft has to be lined up with the worm gear on the steering gear. So it has a splined area. You just mark those two areas. It's a clear lineup, and one guy guides it on there with the other one pushing it in. Now, this column has been completely restored, again, just like the dash assembly, except that we did this component here. So it gets completely disassembled, media blasted. Turn signal switches are replaced because they're always bad. Turn signal levers get re-chromed. Steering wheel gets restored. The paint is the original black suede that you see on the rest of the dash so that it all matches. A shiny steering column was never something Chrysler did. We don't do it either. But at the end, you've got this 50-year-old steering column that's seen a lot of history over the years that looks like it's just getting set in the car for the first time in 1969. I painted our 69 Charger a gorgeous T5 copper poly. Car came out great. We really just took our time, which Mark supports big time. No matter how long it takes, he doesn't care. As long as when I send it to assembly, it's perfect. The color laid out great. I haven't done this color before. Not that it's tricky or anything, but it is nice to do a new color. The clear coat laid out great. The cut and buff looks good. So this is just one of those cars that you send over to assembly that you're like, man, I cannot wait to see this car put together because from top to bottom, the car looks perfect and Mark's in love with it. Until Justin and I took tires and wheels, put it underneath the car with no suspension, then lowered it down like it was like a pro mod or something or a drag car. He didn't like it, but we did. I put pictures on my Instagram if you want to go see. So with that, our 1969 Charger RTSE 440 Four speed is ready to go. Get the vinyl top installed and the headliner. Our 1969 Dodge Charger RTSE 444 speed numbers matching car just came back from the upholstery shop. It's had the new black vinyl top and headliner installed. Now for them to be able to put that vinyl top on and the headliner in, some provisions have to be given to them at the time, such as the SE badging that goes on the roof because it goes underneath the headliner. The vinyl top trim, you have the fasteners that are accessible underneath the headliner. So they do all of that stuff over at the upholstery shop. Stans does a great job for us. They have, I've known him, John, that runs the place for years. They do phenomenal work. But I, I still, even at moments like this, I miss Larry. I do love to see the quality work and I'm glad that we're carrying on, but it always kind of brings up a little bit of those old days when Larry had come in here and, and work around the shop. We had a good time in those days. Um, we're getting ready to do our second primer on our 1970 Cuda. I love the 70s, it's literally hands down my favorite car. On top of it, it's going Panther pink. How badass is it to have a 1970 Cuda pink? Seriously, I mean, pink? That's uh, Panther pink FM3 Moulin Rouge is by far my favorite color. I haven't sprayed it before, I'm super excited. And I just think the fact that Mopar did a pink muscle car was crazy back then, and it's crazy now, but you just appreciate what they did so much more. I can't wait to get this car done. But with that being said, we're gonna do our second primer. Make sure it all looks good. Get it back out of the booth, which I know it'll look good because I've done most of this car myself, and I just care just a little bit more. And uh, not that I don't care about the other people's cars, but this one just really hits home. Get this thing blocked out. Cannot wait to paint this car. The only unfortunate thing about it is the owner is gonna assemble it himself. So once we get the body and paint done and it looks perfect, it's gonna get shipped out of here, which is actually gonna be pretty quick. So we're getting ready to put the wheels and tires on, Curtis's 68 Plymouth Roadrunner. We bought replicas. Uh, Classic Industries makes a really nice replica of the wheel and the tire that we wanted to use. So originally this car, when it rolled off the assembly line, had a Magnum 500 wheel. That's an all chrome, five spoke looking uh, wheel. It's a 14 by five and a half from the factory and it had an F70 14 red streak tire on it. We enhanced that because I know from experience like the Hemi cars that had the 15 by six wheel, 
they used an F7015. We went with a 15.7 replica of the Magnum 500. Everything else is the same. It's just a little bit taller and a little bit wider. And then we went with the Red Streak F7015 tires. That gives it a bolder look than it had, and it allows it a little bit more sidewall, a little bit more cushion, and handles better. It's just a wider footprint. So it's a good upgrade because at a glance, it looks absolutely stock unless you go up to it and read the side of the tire that says it's a 15 versus an original 14. One thing to make quick note of, this car was very original. We were able to save the original rear axle studs and the front hub studs. That means on the left-hand side of this car, it uses a left hand. How many of you guys remember that? Trying to break the lug nuts loose on the side of the road to find out that Mopar threw you a curveball. If you had a 70 and older car, you had left-hand threads on the left-hand side of the car. I guess they figured out that didn't need to be done in 71 because that went away and they were right hand all the way around. So in the interest of accuracy, we left those on there. And so now with the wheels and tires on the car, we officially have a roller. We can get it loaded up on the rollback, take it over and have the headliner put in. It's not a vinyl top car, so all it's gotta have is the headliner put in it. When it comes back over here, we'll begin to assemble the interior. We'll drop off the seats, which is a two-tone blue interior. And so when that interior comes back and goes together, that car is really gonna scream 1968. So on the 1970 Roadrunner, the car actually blocked out really well. So it doesn't need, you know, four coats over the whole car. Noah's been with me for a little while now. I put him through the ringer because I do with all my new helpers, but he's really stuck it out. He's done a great job. So at this point with where he's at, I can cut cars loose to him and say primer him. The first couple of cars he did were kind of dry because you could tell he was scared of running it. But on this 1970 Roadrunner, he went in and primed it, and it looks as if I did it. He's got a good technique. It, it's truly a great job. So I'll let him do this for like a month or two, just keep priming and priming and paying attention to the way that primer's going on. So in a month or two, the next step will be, hey, here's some base coat. You just keep stepping him through the process, and he sticks with me, so I love it. So at this point, we're probably a couple months away before he'll actually start spraying some color, and then he'll be able to take a step back and say, okay, well now I get it. He had me spraying DP90, which it sucks, but I'm learning technique and how to spray, how to adjust a gun, so by the time he gets to paint, it's gonna be second nature to him. What I have him do is go in there and address the areas that maybe got rebody worked a little bit. Put a coat or two on on just the breakthrough areas. Let that dry, once that's dry, start doing your coats around the whole entire car. And it's not just pick up a gun and go in primer. Once he gets that first coat around the whole entire car, you need to take a step back and say, okay, is this car straight? You know, do we have any issues? Do I need to load it up here a little bit more? It looks like the car came out beautiful from what I can see so far. So at this point, it's just a matter of blocking it down again, and we should be good to go. This car is going plum crazy which is a gorgeous color. It's one of everyone's, I think, favorite color to do. It's not as exciting for us because we do a lot of that color. But it's a darker color and it does show sand scratches, body lines that aren't right. It's almost like doing a car black. So especially knowing it's going that dark of a color, it, I trust Noah to go in there and do the right steps on the primer job so when it comes time for the final block, it looks great. In season six of Graveyard Cars, we restored this stunning 1967 GTX convertible with a factory 426 Hemi. True or false, the transmission behind that 426 Hemi was a four-speed manual. If you think you remember and know the answer, stay tuned after the break. We'll see how you did. Okay, folks, how did we do on that one? Our beautiful 1967 GTX convertible, 426 Hemi. What was backing that big mill up? If you said a four-speed manual transmission, you are absolutely right. This is a four-speed car, one of the rarest ones on the planet today. It also featured a white power convertible top, blue interior with a console shift around that beautiful four-speed, and one of the richest and most luxurious interiors in Graveyard Cars history.
On our 1970 Cuda Graveyard Dreams tribute car, the time has come for the reveal to the owners. They have seen pictures of the car before, so I don't suspect that voila moment. Although in person, things look a lot better than they do in pictures. And this is a 1970 Cuda 446 barrel, exactly the way the manufacturer would have made it, except for two characters in the VIN. Look at that. Oh my yeah. gosh, is this for real? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Look at so the other than the vehicle identification number, there is no way to tell, physically no way to tell that this car is not an original six barrel car. The only way you can tell the difference between this car and a real Vico car is that vehicle identification number. That's it. When you look at this car and you walk around it and you look at those camera shots, that's what that car looks like in real life. So no matter how many pictures the folks have seen, I still suspect they're gonna be blown away at the quality. <sighs> I noticed on our original and look at the green, the way that green pops. The black hockey stick, it's the perfect touch. That rear spoiler, the Kregers, the shaker hood, the Argent grill, the blacked out back mandatory on the Cuda car. This is the way a 70 Cuda looked Ooh. when it was brand new. Wow. This is the way a 70 Cuda looks when you have Graveyard Dreams build you the car you always wanted. Jace, come here. When I walk around it with the folks, it's a permagrin on both faces. They have their grandson with them. Look at the dual exhaust. Which I thought was great. You gotta keep those younger generation involved, right? They gotta, they gotta find out why are, we have our passions. If you don't share it with them, they're not gonna know. What do you think, okay. <laughs> I love it. Now I gotta sit You should sit up. in it. Okay. That is the hmm. very desirable Rimblow steering wheel. Yes. So the standard one was just a three-spoke steering wheel and you'd hit the horn button in the middle. On a Barracuda, you got the cool fish. And out here is your horn. You just squeeze oh. that. That's why they call it a rim blow, because on the outer rim of it. Yep. Huh. Every one of these is a replica of an original part or the original parts that we've reconditioned. My gosh, this just doesn't feel real. <laughs> That's my job. That's what I do as the dream maker. Okay. And there is your oh trip God. back through time. So wow. she'd been waiting many years to see that car from high school in her garage. So she's taking her time, walking around it, checking it out meticulously to make sure it's exactly what she remembered and exactly what she wanted moving forward. And that's what we want at Graveyard Cars, Graveyard Dreams. I want to make sure that it's everything you dreamed and hoped and waited so long and invested so much in. Everything is exactly Look period that. correct, right down to the date coated belts, hoses, mm -hmm. battery cables. There's your vacuum reservoir. That's the only thing we had to add. Yeah. Yeah. They wanted such a big camshaft in it that it doesn't create vacuum, so I had to add an auxiliary. We just wanted a little bit of a camshaft uh -huh. in it. That's not what his wife said at the show. <laughs> I walked up to it and the whole car was shaking all over the place and it was the biggest cam I ever heard in my entire life. And if it doesn't have the right cam, I'm not paying for it. Something like that. So I said, I called Comp and I said, just send me the biggest cam that the engine will actually run. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, do you like I, to hear it run? Yes, yeah. that's what I've been waiting for. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. The most critical part of any build is to make sure the car runs and drives as good as it looks. In the case of our 70 Cuda, it absolutely surpassed all of my greatest hopes. Think of that. Mm -hmm. Tachometer, oil pressure, water temperature, fuel, and charging. And the clock was rebuilt and digitized, so it actually okay. worked. Listen to that. Listen to See that. See that shaker hood shaking? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, well. They have, I think, a Camaro, Chevelle, box. Nobody cares. That's the coolest feature. That I don't care. Is. If you're a GM guy, a Ford guy, the shaker <laughs> is just cool. <laughs> but they do have other muscle cars, and they do know kind of what they're looking for. Ta-da. What do you think? <laughs> oh, love? I love it. I love it. What do you say we pull it outside? Yeah. Hey, pull it out. All right. This young man got to come down and go for a joy ride in a 70 Cuda 446 barrel tribute car, which I, as a kid, would have absolutely loved. You ready to go for a ride, Jace? Okay, here we go, Jace. 
It's a close ratio transmission, really nice. Yeah. yeah, isn't that nice? Different than the Camaro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why I think Jim wanted it. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna get a ticket. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Grandma's gonna end up in jail. You gonna bail her out when she goes? <laughs> The inherent vibrations and rattles that come with a fresh restoration or a 50-year-old car aren't there because the time was taken and the provisions were made between the sound deadener products and the undercoating and all of the items that were done to the car to make sure that it was a solid car, even more solid and more durable than they did at the factory, all show up in that road test. With a six-speed, you can do anything you want. You can tool around at nothing or you can go 100 miles an hour. Yeah. Oh, but I can definitely drive this better than the Camaro. <laughs> oh, this has got power steering, power disc brakes, yeah. Like it's driving in this more because oh. the Camaro's too noisy. <laughs> so when you're driving this car down through town, it really does handle well. There are no rattles, no vibrations. So Justin out in the assembly shop, he's really evolved. Yeah, the exhaust system on the car is the one it would have sort of liked with the factory. It's a, called Hemi mufflers and dual exhaust. It's just a, it's got resonators on it too that kind of quiet it down, all factory stuff, so. The car pulls like crazy. I cannot wait until she gets this car home. Got a little practicing to do. You're doing good. Doing really good. This car pulls hard. You got six gears from Silver Sport to row through to make sure that you have the exact gearing you want. Backed up with that 354, Dana? Mm hmm Yeah, it's gonna pick them up and put them down, and it does. I love when you give it a little gas and watch your shaker bubble. Yeah. So you start walking up, I think that's so cool. When you stomp that gas, you can watch that shaker come up into the hood, you know it's touching the bottom of that hood. This is rubber mount, we put the original rubber mounts in, and it stretches that rubber mount to the max. You can see it, you can see it in the pure, brute torque that a 446 barrel creates. So you think this drives better than a Camaro? Yeah, I do. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, I do. Those Kregers, with the offset and the tires, the BF Kruger's TA radials, it just sucks that road up underneath it. And it makes you feel like you're not driving a 50-year-old car. Grandma's looking pretty cool, huh? Yeah. You're gonna have the coolest grandma in town. Yeah, today. I guarantee you that. There's no doubt Laura's really enjoying the test drive. Initially, when she took off in the car, she was a little bit apprehensive. It's a brand new car and she hasn't driven it before. But by the second block, she was able to row through the gears. She was standing on it a little bit, watching that shaker come up, feeling that torque that's so exciting. When we got back, I just knew that we had done our job well. The smiles, her grandson was absolutely loving it sitting in the back seat. Jim was as proud as could be that his wife finally got her dream. So in the end, when you're loading up one of these cars for the owners and you know that they're going to enjoy it for many decades, the way we do our cars, it'll be around past their time, probably past their kids' time. That's why we take the steps that we do to make sure that car can become an heirloom. But knowing that is my sense of satisfaction and self-worth, that I brought a car back from the dead, I fulfilled a dream, and I did it all while having a blast. Oh, and getting paid for it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Bunsen burners, nice little earners. Coin.